Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Sander Lanch podcast. Today, we are going to be talking about three chapters of the Words of Radiance, or not the words, of Words of Radiance by Brandon Sanderson. I know what the book is called. <laughs> Chapter 12, Hero, to end part one, and then the first two interludes, Narak and Yim. There's actually four interludes be- before the next uh, part, so that uh, that's a bit of a change from last time, too. In these chapters, Kaladin works on figuring out some of his powers with the crew, and then a prediction that some people made last time comes true. And then, in the interludes, we meet some Parshman, and we meet a Cobbler, and things uh, not going great for either of them, really, but we'll get to that. I'm Data, and with me today is... Dak. And Joe. Jamie's feeling under the weather today, so... Just the three of us. It's a boys' night. Let's see how it goes. Hold on to something, everybody. The Sander Lanch is about to begin. Crack open a cold one with really the boys. Really unsure of yourself. Like uh, like it was going to be awful with just the boys. <laughs> <clears throat> you were like, I guess let's see how this goes. <laughs> it's, it's the TV show The Boys. So yeah, we had the end of part one this time, and it ended, I think, like you guys kind of expected. What did you guys think of these three chapters? So, chapter was was pretty good. Interesting just to see Kaladin doing his thing, hanging out with the boys. Like, that that was all fun. And then, yeah, ended on Amaram, where we all called that one. Except so, Jamie. Jamie thought it was going to be Wit, and now she's not here to defend herself. Look, I mean, Wit's also a, a fair guess, I think. So, that works. Interludes. So the second interlude was kind of all right. Yep, bit bleak. Like it really reminded me of like the the dudes who helped Kavoth out in Name of the Wind when he's living on the streets of Tarbian. Oh yeah, I like the that. you know the, there was that one nice old cobbler who gave him the free set of shoes. Oh, because he could because he tell he could tell he was the he was a harmless wretch. And that other dude who like lived in the cellar and looked after the urchins of the city. So it really reminded me of those guys. Don't think he deserved the end that he got. So bleak. But the first interlude, like, we have been clamoring for ages. It's like, we need to know more of the Parshendi. Yep. We need to know more of the Parshendi. And we finally got something. I fucking devoured it. And I'm just like, yes, this. I need more of this. This is fascinating. I love it. I love Just the stuff that gets revealed in it just off the cuff. It's like, oh, we have all these different forms that we can grow into and we can change our forms. We can effectively shapeshift. I'm like, what? I must know more. <laughs> So, yes, I loved every second. And I think Eshenai and I is kind of interesting. I could be biased because she, cause she's the first Parshendi we've met properly. Mm-hmm. But I get the impression, so she's the shard bearer that yep. Dalinar fought? That's the implication? Well, it's not just an implication, actually. Do you remember the chapter title where Dalinar fights the shard bearer is Eshenai? And we had no I idea what it meant that. at the time. But Okay, cool. All right. Which, I mean... That's funny, considering Dalinar spent quite a bit of that battle just going, wait, are they women? <laughs> it's true, yeah. It's like, wait a second, wait a second. Yep. Yeah. yeah, no, so, yeah, absolutely love that interlude. In terms of, like, stuff that moves the plot forward, it probably wasn't that heavy, but it was something that I've wanted for so long to find, and finally I was getting answers, so I'm just, I lapped it, I lapped it up. I loved it. Yeah, and it's not just, like, a little trickle of some answers, either. It's, like full-on immersion in the society and explaining so much. I agree. It's uh, it's about time, and I really enjoy that. Yeah. Yeah. And you're like, yeah, the other stuff was, yeah, whatever. But this, this is, uh, <laughs> yeah. The other, the other stuff wasn't bad, but um, unfortunately, it happened in the same block as we got this. <laughs> so, yes, I don't, I don't blame you. We found out some interesting stuff about, you know, Kaladin's powers, and uh, I... I the Yim chapter was just like completely separate from almost everything that we've read so far. So I mean, it's not it, the first time that happens. That's happened. It's in true. The series. So that's all good. A lot of the um, interviews have been like that. Yeah. I, I mean, I, to give the Kaladin uh, chapter its due. I do think it was really cool to see him hanging out with the guys, but the guys are also sort of interacting with each other and bantering back and forth. Cause mm-hmm. we don't really get a chance to see a lot of that either. 
because we see it through Ka- everything through Kaladin's eyes, like he's the boss man, we don't get to see what the guys do when he's not around. So it was cool to see them sort of bantering back and forth as well, Lopin getting stuck to the wall and the others having a good chuckle. <laughs> Uh, the Lopin repeatedly stuck to the wall is great. Yep. Yeah, I, look, I, you know, we're, we're going to sound kind of repetitive here because I kind of feel almost exactly the same way Dak does about everything that he said. Yeah, it was uh, the, the first chapter, you know, not a ton of important stuff happens. Something important happens right at the end, but we kind of kind of we've kind of guessed that. So it wasn't a big shock to us as it might have been to like another reader who hadn't like thought it through and guessed that before. So that kind of like reveal for us was kind of like, well, that's kind of what some of us were expecting. So we got, you know, what we expected, but uh, yeah, I loved all of the, all of this stuff with the, uh, with the Parshendi there, they can, yeah, the, basically everything Dak said, they can be different forms. So interesting. So cool to know that like, there's this whole culture going on. The fact that the Parshmen are a different form called slave form. Like that's crazy. And so also like mate form, you know, just every little piece of it was like, this is, this is great. I love this. What a, what a cool way to kind of give us a, a backstage pass to, to this stuff. And um, I think, I think even more shocking to me, I think they said in this, in that section that she's the only shard bearer left of the Parshendi, which is probably why yep. they haven't been seeing shard bearers as often because she's the only one left. She's the general. She's having to lead all the forces. We do get a, a sense that they actually, their forces are waning, which is good information for us to know. But yeah, they're about to, about to do some crazy stuff, it sounds like, which is maybe leading into some of these chapter beginnings that we've been reading from uh, from Navani. So definitely super fun to read that, get some behind the scenes information, some delicious knowledge nuggets, as I like to say. And uh, yeah, the Yim stuff was a little underwhelming. It was kind of nice, pleasant at first, and then it has a sad turn. I mean, I, I think if this interlude has anything to do with the story it's showing us two things right it's showing us a that there are other people who are awakening to surges Mm -hmm. in the world and b there's this creepy dude who's an assassin who seek who's like a vigilante justice type guy running around so we've got two interesting things from that section that may affect our story at large but it did remind me a lot of the interlude of like there's the one with the guy documenting all the different spren and then the two people that are like measuring fire spread and stuff so like it was very i felt like it was very reminiscent of those two except there might actually be some some good stuff coming out of that section possibly so i'm excited for the potential of what what could happen so that's fair yeah it's uh you're right that i think the probably the biggest is that the first thing that you mentioned where this is letting us know that there are other people like developing relationships with Spren and awakening to these powers. Yeah. Like throughout the world. Which would make sense. Yeah. Which would make sense. Cause it seems to be all happening around the same time. Shalon, Kaladin. I, I mean, I, I guess Dalinar, I, I still am not like quite sure on that. Cause we haven't seen a Spren no, around yeah, Dalinar. Really haven't. But, but yeah, we haven't we, seen him with got, any like superpowers or anything either. Right. Yeah. So. And that was another thing I was wondering is like with Seth, like we don't, we we haven't heard of a spren being around Seth, and maybe that's just True. something we're not pri- we're not privy to. But uh, but yeah, so that's uh, that's definitely a lot of a lot of cool potential stuff could be happening. Maybe he's yeah. not allowed to talk about it because of his uh, unspoken status. Yeah, or whatever may it's not called. be. Maybe the spren developing is what like cut him off from his people. Uh, you're you're people. talking to a spren out. Well, I mean, yeah, that 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 could be because. Like, like I don't know his, culturally what their deal is, so like that may be mm, like against that may be taboo for them. Yeah, that well they seem to be from the one part of the planet that isn't affected by high storms and there's grass and stuff. Like the whole ecosystem is different, so maybe like this side of the planet is affected by one shard, but this one section of the planet is affected by the other one who made it. And the spread were all about one of those shards, so he got a spread. Oh, yeah. It's like, well, now you're part of them. Now you get out. Yeah. The other thing in the Yim section that I was thinking about that I just was reminded about was like the one talk and like experiences and stuff. So like mm-hmm. I was like, hmm, well, maybe that has something to do with something. But it was such a it was such a like, oh, this is a nice, cool guy. And then he's dead. It was it was almost like and maybe Brand is doing this intentionally. He wants us to forget about this guy so that it could be a twist later. But like, I don't know. It was just it was, it was just a bunch of interesting stuff that kind of happened there. So. 
yeah, this idea of, uh, I guess it's just their religion where it's like, we were all part of one thing that broke itself apart to experience things. Like it's, that's very different from anything else that we've heard about so far. Yeah. I mean, the idea, that idea that's saying broke itself apart, you know, that could be two different kinds of things. It could be like a shard splintering itself on purpose, which would be interesting hmm. or like, or just like using body power versus spirit power. Like, in uh Skadrial, so like i don't know there's lots of kind of weird potential things yeah that's fair okay well let's move into these chapters we have the first one was hero and our only epigraph for this section with Navani's journal saying unfortunately we fixated upon sadius is plotting so much that we did not take note of the changed pattern of our enemies the murderers of my husband the true danger i would like to know what wind brought about their sudden inexplicable transformation but she uses the word transformation here, and then later mm, we find mm. out that that's kind of a thing that they do. They transform. They're yeah. they're not like they're not like the transformers, but they do transform. They're robots in disguise. Oh no, wait. Yeah. Also, like I I know like we didn't we didn't what we got is what we got right. Like we're not getting more information at this point. But like, does that transformation take time, or can mm. I like sing a song and then be a different thing immediately? Right. Like I don't know. It's just it's kind of a weird weird thing. Yeah, like I want to know more about the transformations and how they trigger it because, like, does it mean at any time? Uh, I think, like, you know, can they, can the Parshmen who serve the, like, who are serving the Alethi, can they transform at will or do they have to be pushed into it or? Yeah, dull form or whatever. Do they got to be prodded into it? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to me because as far as we've heard from the Alethi, the Parshmen of the normal parchman that serve them that are enslaved or whatever, they don't transform. Like that's not something that they know about, but we also get, we also find out that like there's a mate form, which is theoretically how they reproduce. So the ones that the Alethi have must reproduce also, or they wouldn't be around. So I don't know. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess we don't know what their lifespan is though. So like, that's true. Yeah. I don't know. For, yeah. Thing. For all- for all the answers we got, there are still a lot of questions. And yeah. I mean, really, it's like that just raises further questions. <laughs> yeah. Because, I mean, like you say, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense for the Parshmen, unless they have like extremely long lives when not in combat, you know, like elves from, from Middle Earth or something. It's like if they don't have to go to mate form to reproduce, if they do have to go to mate form to reproduce, like that would be noticed, wouldn't it? You would think, right? And if they didn't have to mate, mate to go to reproduce, or if they don't need to reproduce because they don't age the same way, then they then I feel like people would be like, man, why aren't these parchment getting any older? They never die. Now, you got me thinking of them like, the men have enslaved the elves, and this is what happens. Yeah, this is what happens, Larry. <laughs> when you meet a stranger in the Alps. That's right. <sighs> um, so we, we, we're, so we start with Kaladin and the crew down in the chasm. And they're testing out Kaladin's ability to stick stones to things. And Rock, like, he sticks a stone in place, and Rock jumps up and grabs it and is hanging there. This time he holds me! Which I guess implies that previous times he has not held him. Yeah. I don't feel like the, they're very good at their experiments, because, like, they start out with Rock holding, like, holding on to the rock. Yeah. And then they're like, ah, he doesn't need to do that. And I'm like, well, I mean, could you measure, you would probably want to measure if outside force affects Makes a difference, yeah. the duration of the hold or whatever but hey who am i i'm not a scientist i'm just well, some I mean, guy as they get into it like bigger problems in their approach right. become clear but yeah like you know how can you accurately measure the amount of stormlight in a sphere to be able to measure these things yeah yeah it doesn't it uh, yeah i think he should just figure out how it works like not how long he can do it for i mean i like i feel like it's a good idea to be like, because knowing how long a rock is going to stick there and or how much weight it could ha- hold and if that would decrease it, like this is all important stuff. Sure. But if you can't like, so I, I would probably start with, let's get several of these same size gems and you suck one up, stick a rock, suck another one up, stick, stick a different rock. So first try to test if it's relatively consistent between. Right. Yeah, and the then cuts of the stone yeah. and all that stuff. If it is, then you can move on to, OK, well, we know that that's consistent. So now if we apply pressure like somebody's hanging from it, does that change it? Or if it's not consistent, then you're like, OK, well, we'll have to come up with some other ideas for, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, I get what you're saying, but at the same time, like 
the way that we have seen this stormlight we, we, uh, wielded, welded? I, I don't know. Wielded, uh, that's correct, I think. Wielded. Yeah, yep. the way we have seen this used, the user doesn't seem too concerned about the amount of stormlight they have left. So mm. in that instance, like you're talking about being able to wield this power in combat, I think your first, like, your first worry shouldn't be like, how long can I do this for? It should be about getting something like Seth, like getting it done as quickly and efficiently as possible. Eh, maybe. Well, and, you know, maybe that's just me talking. I mean, I would like to know the science behind it and like how long a thing can do a thing or whatever. But I don't know that now is the time for them to figure that out. You know, that's something that should be done like in a controlled like in a more controlled environment than what they're currently doing it in. in yeah, if, if they could be more controlled, for sure. I don't know that there is a more controlled environment in this case. Well, not on the Shattered Plains, but I mean, yeah. somebody who, who's awakening the surges who could be in like some kind of scientific community could could be much Oh, better. that's true. If you get like a like a, a ardent. Yeah, okay. So an ardent who was becoming a, a night radiant or whatever. Yeah. Too bad the jam didn't make uh, caps <laughs> all awaken to searches. Am I right? You, you, I mean, maybe, jam, maybe, man. maybe he did. Maybe. No, you know. I, I don't think so. <laughs> he, he's just like, I don't need surges. He just puts the jam on the rock and sticks it to the canyon wall. <laughs> he's like, <laughs> I've got sticky jam. So, and I, I do like at some point, Kaladin points out, if you want a baseline, shouldn't we see how long the stone remains there without rock hanging from it? And Sigil, Sigil's just like, well, yeah, but that's less fun. <laughs> He's like, I want my science to be fun, damn it. Really, this is the first time we've seen Sigil display a sense of humor. It's true. And you think, well, if Hoyd was your teacher, surely you'd have to develop one. <laughs> yeah, uh, you might you go the other way. Joke. Uh, yeah, yeah. What's true. going on? You might be like, I hate this guy. I hate you. Oh, see, now imagine them traveling around together, and Sigzel is like the straight man in every situation. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. He's like, he's like, who's on first? <laughs> oh, and ain't that the the Vinonarso theme song? You do that for Hoyd and Sigzel. Yeah, I could. I'm not gonna. Touche. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> every week, Joe's going to have to rewrite the. The I mean, it's that. not that much of a rewrite. You just change out some <laughs> names and find something they do in common. Uh, okay. You do it. Everybody else do it in your head. Use your own creative juices. There you yeah, go. Let's let's all take a minute so everyone can sing the song to themselves. Yeah. There you go. Fucking magical. It was. You can rewind that and replay as many times as you need to to compose your song. <laughs> That's right. Compose your song. You be the artist. Don't use AI. <laughs> I know that's, uh, a, that's a hot topic in our Discord right now, Data told yeah. me, so don't do it. So Sigzel's making, like, writing numbers down, and, like, the other bridgemen are kind of uncomfortable. It's like, oh, man, that's a dude. He's writing stuff. <laughs> And uh, but Kaladin notes that fortunately we've got like Rock and Sigzel and Loket, Lopin. They're all from like other countries that don't care as much. Herdaz, where Lopin is from, is technically Voren, but they have their own brand of it, it says. So that makes me curious. And Rock's like, hey, you said there was other stuff you could do, right? And Lopin's like, yeah, fly. And Kaladin's like, I can't fly. Walk on walls. Yeah, I tried that. Nearly broke my head. No flying or walking on walls. I need to impress the women, Lopin says. I don't think sticking rocks to walls will be enough. And I love Sigsel's like, well, I mean, it defies the laws of nature. I think that's pretty impressive. And Lopin's like, you don't know many Herdazian women, do you? <laughs> Lopin's like, nerd! <laughs> and then they point out, oh, hey, there's that other thing Kaladin can do where, like, he made all the arrows fly at him. That's pretty cool. That is pretty cool. And Kaladin's like, well, I've never done that, like, intentionally. I don't even know how to do it. And the rock falls off, and I love that Sigzel's like, okay, 87 seconds. What did you guys get? And Kaladin's like, wait, we were supposed to be counting? And Rock just shrugs. And Lopin goes, 91 seconds. You're welcome. Which, you guys are off by, like, four seconds. I feel like not very good. <laughs> Sigzel just looks at them and it's like, you all suck at science. <laughs> <laughs> and then they start pointing out the problems, where it's like, I need a clock for precise timing, but those are expensive. We have no way to measure stormlight. And Callan's like, well, I mean, you know, chips, they're the gemstones are precisely me measured before they're put in glass. And he's like, well, yeah, but what if they hold different amounts? 
We know uncut ones hold less than cut ones, so does how it's cut make a difference? And Stormlight fades from the Sears over time. How many days has it been since that one was infused? How much light has it lost? Like, we don't know. And then Lopin's like, well, I mean, we, that means we should just test other things, right? Like, can you stick me to a wall? And Cal's like, I, I don't know. And so he decides <laughs> to try. I love it. Like, before he does it, he looks at Sigzil, and Sigzil's like, mm, fuck it, why not? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so we got we to figure this out somehow. And so, yeah, he, he puts some Stormlight on Lopin's outfit and sticks him against the wall, and he just stays hanging there feel like if you could disrobe, because he didn't stick Lope into the wall. He right. stuck his outfit to the wall. Whereas later, he actually, like, sticks rock to the to the rock. Pun intended. And so Kaladin it starts to realize, like, this... Okay, all of a sudden, there's all sorts of useful things. Like, could I put light on the floor and enemies run across it and get stuck? Could I stop a wagon? Could I stick my spear to an enemy shield and pull it out of their hands? Like, there's all sorts of stuff that this could be useful for that I've never even thought about. He's, he's playing um, Zelda Tears of the Kingdom with the like the fuse mechanic and trying yeah, to figure exactly. out the best way yeah. to implement it. Ka-choom! Is there a timer involved, though? And Lopin gives a... I think so. Lopin tells a bad joke about uh, what did the one-armed Herdazian do to the man who stuck in the wall to the wall? Nothing, because he was armless. <laughs> Good one, and Tish. Good one, Lopin. Lopin's like, yeah, my mom always told me, you gotta learn to laugh at these things before others do. Uh, she's a very wise woman. I once brought her the head of a chull. Kyle's like, wait, what? Yeah, chull head. Very good to eat. And then Rock is, like, Rock is like, no, he's right. The head's the best part. And everyone else is like, all right, then. <laughs> <laughs> Moving right past that. And it's time to experiment. And so we cut to like them in the middle of like a fight. Lopin, Rock, and Sigzel versus Kaladin. And Kaladin starts using his powers to like do various things. Put some light on a spear and throws it at Rock to like, stick to stuff. And makes Lopin's spear, like, stick. He, he puts Stormlight on it and then shoves it the tip into a pile of wood and bones and things. So it's unwieldy. And really, he just wipes the floor with them uh, using his powers along the way. It goes really well. Although, when it's over, Callan's like, I mean, I probably could have just beaten him regular, like, as fast. Because yep. Lopin is, frankly, not that good with a spear. He's only got one arm. I almost had you, Rock says, as he's, like, stuck to the ground. Slippery as a fifth son you are. And he's like stuck loping to a wall again. I want to know what that cultural reference is. Slippery as a fifth son. Like, what does that mean? <laughs> okay, I watch those fifth sons, sons are slippery. They're, slippery. Yeah. <laughs> they're just all greased up. Uh, and uh, yeah, Rock says he's the wrong son to be a soldier. That's for fourth son or below. Third son cannot be wasted in battle. Yeah, but it's the, it's the fifth son who is slippery in battle. Yeah, exactly. And the fourth and sixth son? Now you guys suck at battle. <laughs> and I love, didn't stop you from throwing a tree at my head what small tree and very hard head there you go and meanwhile Lopin is still stuck to the wall he's like yeah just leave the Herdazian stuck to the wall the view is wonderful see th that's the first time I really got an Australian impression from Lopin <laughs> hey, the, the probably the most mainstream comparison I can draw is like the latest Mortal Kombat movie with Kano oh uh, yeah He's he's like in like his opening scene where reptile attacks att attacks them all, and he's and he's tied to the chair, and like Sonya and and original dude run off to fight reptile, and and Kano's just like, oh yeah, sure, just leave me tied to the fucking chair, whatever. <laughs> very, like I was just like, oh my god, that's the most Australian thing I've seen in a, a Hollywood movie in a very long time. And then Lopin does it here. He's like, oh yeah, just fucking leave me stuck up here. Views great, by the way. Like, <laughs> oh yeah, hundred percent. That's an Aussie thing. Uh, now I want to listen to how that sounds in the audiobook. Uh, my other hand, the one that was cut off long ago, eaten by a fearsome beast, it is making a rude gesture towards you right now. I thought you'd wish to know so you can be prepared to be insulted. <laughs> I, I love Lopin. The Lopin. He's great. And so, like, Kaladin has that thought that he's like, I mean, I probably could have just beat them using the extra speed and strength of Stormlight instead of, you know, the various tricks. But familiar familiarity... I need to know these abilities as well as I know my spear. So, you know, practice them. Get them in the toolbox so that on the spur of the moment, if one is more useful than your spear, you'll be able to use it. Which is exactly what we talked about on an episode or two ago where it was like Kaladin needs to learn how to use his powers. And so finally he's on the same page. Yep. And he's just like, I must use these powers for good. Sir, Amaram has just arrived in camp. Mm. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Dalinar's just like, get uh, me my spear. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, no, no. It's even more petty. Dallin, I was like, where's Amaram? He was supposed to be here for our meeting an hour ago. And they go to Amaram's quarters and he's like literally stuck to his bed. He can't get out. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, wait, how did this happen? I don't know. I just laid down and all of a sudden I couldn't get back up. Kaladin like snuck in there and put light in his bed. Oh, could Kaladin use Stormlight to like stick his lips together so he can't talk? Ooh, nice. I like this idea. Could you imagine, like, that's, that sort of factor? Can't eat. <laughs> yeah, suck it, guy we don't like. Um, so it's pretty kind of kind of horrific when you think about it. It is, yes. Uh, Teft shows up, and basically he tries to convince Kaladin to give the new recruits to somebody else to train. And Kaladin's like, nope, it's your job. You're going to do fine. And Teft's like, oh, okay. And he says there were ten, Kaladin says there's ten orders of Knights Radiant, right? Do you know much about the others? And Teft's like, eh, not really. I know the orders didn't always get along. And then Kaladin's like, what would you say if you heard that somebody wanted to refound the Knights Radiant? Not me, you know, just somebody somewhere. <laughs> and Teft goes, Sometime. Well, I'd, I'd say that guy's an idiot. You're an idiot. And so basically, like, Teft is like, I mean, are you going to come out? Basically, you're going to go public with this? And Syl is kind of expects that he will. And Kaladin's just like, I mean, we're going to think about, we have to be careful about this. And he kind of doesn't really commit more one way or the other. And then he tells Syl, like, I'm, I want to practice more first, but maybe. And here we have, even in Bridge 4, Moash was the only one who didn't treat Kaladin like some mythological savior, Harold. Him and maybe Rock. So there, th- there's that, at least. We were talking about before, like, Rock doesn't seem to idolize him, and sure enough. I was going to say, what's this maybe business? <laughs> he just swung a log at you. He mocks you for your hard head. And then they get up there, and somebody says, one of the soldiers is like, Stormblessed, have you heard the news? A hero has come to the Shattered Plains. He's going to meet with Bright Lord oh, Cole and perhaps support him. And you remember the title of this uh, chapter is Hero, so now we know who that is referencing. What a okay, hero like, this guy is. Yeah, as soon as I said, it's a hero, I'm just like, a, all right, that's definitely fucking Amaram. Yeah, <laughs> this is it, guys. This is where my prediction comes true, right? Remember, I was like, maybe Kaladin and Yasna will hook up. Cause she, cause his dad, her dad was like, oh, you, you need Amaram, Amaram. And she's like, nah, I like this Kaladin guy. And Kaladin's <laughs> like, screw you, Amaram. I'm taking your woman. <laughs> <laughs> that's how you get him back. Yeah. There's, there's, no, that, that's, yeah, that's just how, how Yasna gets him back. It's like, uh, like, oh, you want me to hook up with Amaram? I'm going to find the guy Amaram hates the most and hook up with him instead. <laughs> oh, he's within walking distance. We know that you can tell from his paperwork that Amram's the one who sold him into slavery, so I feel like Dalinar should at least have be able to have a question about like what, what happened here? Did Dalinar even see the paperwork? I don't... I was about oh, to say, that's I doubt fair, maybe not. seen the paperwork. He just bought the slaves from uh, from Sadeus, so... <laughs> yeah, he's like, I gave I gave Sadius a sword, I took all his men, like, a, a, like, like he took a lot of them, like a couple thousand, yeah. didn't he? Almost a thousand, I think, was the number. Yeah, yeah, so it's like he... Like, do you think he's had the time to like, I mean, not even go through because he can't read. He had to get, he'd have to get his scribes to dictate the paperwork for all his slaves to him if he did. I don't think he had time for that. No, that's nah. a good point. Yeah, doesn't sound like something somebody as busy as him would have time for. He's got, he's got shit to do. He's got to, he's got to kick Elkar in the ass again. Yeah, right in the ass, right in the chest, <laughs> right in the old ass chest. Is that a thing? All we a get king here... is my big ass up. Boom. <laughs> all we get here is the soldier says a name, and Kaladin like freaks out and starts running. And he sees a, ba- a banner hanging in the air above some troops. And he's like, no, I don't believe it. And he, he rushes in. I don't to where, believe it. He rushes into where Dalinar is. The Blackthorn clasped hands with a tall man. Old friend, it's been too long, the, the guy says. And Dalinar's like, oh, yeah, way too long. I'm glad you finally made your way here. I heard you even found yourself a shard blade. Oh, yeah, found. And he, like, summons his shard blade and says, oh, yeah, I took this from an assassin who dared to try and kill me on the field. Yeah. Of Took uh, it from an assassin, sure. God, this is just as bad as Sadie's going. It's like, I watched Dalina torn apart in front of my eyes. <laughs> the sigh. <laughs> <laughs> and so, yes, it is indeed Amaram standing there holding the shard blade that killed Kaladin's friends and got others of them killed. So, uh, yeah, this is not good for him. No, it's not. That's where we leave him. Yeah. yeah. Good, for, good for Sadius. Means he's no longer the top of Kaladin's shit list. <laughs> Yeah, I was thinking, uh, I don't know why this just popped in my head when you said, I don't believe it. I was like, I don't believe it. Believe it or not, you're still going to burn, you son of a bitch. (laughs) 
Uh, that's a that's a movie. <laughs> that's some movie. Uh, so that we do get in, in uh, on the Never interludes wrong. main page. We do get the three names of the prospective characters for these interludes: Eshonai, Yim, and Risen. Risen. But as I mentioned, there are four interludes here. So what does that mean? I guess we'll find out. Uh, it, this does mean it's like, oh, no, Seth. Doesn't sound like it. Like, I, don't, I, I guess we haven't seen him yet this book, have we? Yeah, no, considering like the last book ended on you must go and kill Dalinar now. I was like, Seth is taking his sweet fucking time. Right. I mean, I guess we don't know exactly the timing of that conversation. It I could guess. have been like later than been later than everything else that happened in that book. But yeah, and I, I guess like, you know, Yasna and Shalama traveling from the same place and they haven't made it here either. Um, also true. For, ver- yeah. for various reasons. So I don't know how long it takes to get from Carbron to the Shattered Plains, but it does seem weird. It's like, especially because like everyone knows the Assassin in White is active again. It really doesn't seem like people seem to care that much. Well, it, we know that like the King of Yakaved prepared for it. He had like guys hiding under his dinner table ready to pop out in full armor and stuff. So, yeah. I don't know. I, I expected this news to be much more of a bomb to drop in the Alethi war camp than it actually wound up being. Mm. Like, I expected Elkar to lose his fucking mind. I expected the High Princes to just go, oh shit, maybe we do need to start. You know, I expected there to be rumblings, just like uh, something's not gone very wrong. The neighboring king was assassinated, and no one seems to bat an eyelid. The most we got was Navani telling Dalinar, and Dalinar's like, oh, for fuck's sake, him again. I'm like, this is the dude who kills your king? Why does no one give a shit that he's out there killing other kings? Maybe they're hoping, like, Kaladin's crew was hoping that it's like, they killed our king first, so he's moved on to somebody else now, right? Like, we're done. Yeah, I don't know. I still think, like, for someone who is terrified of assassins because his father was assassinated, the news that his father's assassin has come back should have rocked Elokar more than we've actually seen it do. Yeah, that's a fair point. He should probably be interested in chasing the guy down, too. I remember you guys theorized once the news got out that he might just, like, head off to a different country and take his whole army to hunt this guy down. Yeah. But we know that the, the Parshendi did take responsibility for hi, uh, hiring an assassin to kill the king. And we're told in this interlude that Eshra and I was part of the group that decided this we, we have to do this. So it, it's not some misunderstanding. They seriously did arrange the assassination of Gavilar. Yep. Yep. They sure did. So the rhythm of resolve thrummed in the back of Eshunai's mind as she got to the center plateau of the Shattered Plains. Narok. Home. And so she's wearing her shard plate and walking around. They managed to get the gem heart this time. And she's looking for Dalinar. Where are you, Blackthorn? Why have you not come to face me? She's like, I thought I saw him on that run a week or so ago, but I don't know which we know Dalinar saw her on a run. So maybe we're talking about the same run. And so apparently she hangs back in case, you know, some of her people get in trouble and need to shard bearers help. But her leg is still hurt pretty badly from when Kaladin messed her up while she was fighting Dalinar. The city they're in is like ruins basically, but they've moved out here to escape the, the Alethi basically get out here where they can't be found. Uh, it says that she had discovered similar ruins in her explorations, such as the one she'd been on when they first encountered humans seven years ago. So she was one of the first people to meet the humans. And now she's trapped out here. She loves exploring the wide world, and now she can't go anywhere. She sees some stuff and attunes to the rhythm of the lost, a soft beat yet still violent with sharp separate notes. So she, throughout the chapter, she's just attuning to various rhythms. And we know that they we've been told they like sing as they fight. We've been told that one of them like sings a song and you can pass another one out of earshot of that first one singing the same song. So it's that seems to be a reference to these rhythms. Yeah, like they they attune to something and then it just automatically seems to like be a song in there. Maybe not instinctually, but almost I don't know. It almost seems like hereditarily it's like they attune to something and they're like, okay, this is, I I now am singing this thing. The feeling that it gives me here at least is that like when you say attune to it, it makes me think as like, it's something that's out there. Like the rhythm of the lost is just exists and she tunes into it when she wants to express that feeling. And then she tunes into something else for a different feeling. Yeah. 
It almost and and way they describe it later, it almost seems like their transformations happen the same way. They somehow like find some sort of rhythm to attune to mm. that allows them to transform. At least that's the way the way it's described a little bit later. That's the way it sounds to me. Yeah, it's this might be an odd comparison to draw, but it made me think of like you know birds flying south and like feeling the Earth's gravitational pull. It's like oh. these are like some sort of force that exists in the world that they just sort of twig into and have been able to use for their physiological changes or like their mentalities or whatever. Interesting. You know, that's actually, that. that's actually a cooler theory than I, than, than you might think at first glance, because if you think about it that way, then you could, you could say that their transformations are like, in physiological adaptations to their environment right so it's like yeah we, we got to create more of us so let's uh, let's transform into this mate form which is more suited to having children you know that's uh that's actually a pretty cool idea i like it yeah just the it, just, the thing that made me think of it is just like the fact that you know you can have a couple of them singing the same song even though they're separated and they can't possibly hear each other so maybe it is like a, some sort of undercurrent force Right. Somehow that they just sort of twigged into. Yeah. I'm sure it has to do with shard magic. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. And then on a completely different but still interesting note, we're told <laughs> that most of the Shattered Plains had once been populated and this in the center was where the largest city had been. Now it's all ruins, but this whole area used to have people, Parshendi, who knows, living on it. So it's just like we're getting lots of little pieces of stuff here. Uh, listeners is what they call themselves, we learn. It's like Parshendi, that's a human word. Uh, we're the listeners. Human horn. Both Malin, <laughs> human horn, God. Both Malin and Femalin raise their hands to her. So they have different gender words, Malin and Femalin. Mm-hmm. I mean, they sound pretty much the same. It's like, well, I don't want to call them male and female. What are we going to call them, Brandon? <laughs> Malin and Femalin? Perfect. <laughs> so she goes to the Hall of Art where soldiers are trying to paint and they're not very good at it. <laughs> I like how they're, which I mean, you know, it may be completely valid, but I just don't understand why I like how they're like, what they're doing is basically stretching themselves out of the norm for their, for whatever form they're in to like, mm-hmm. see if they can figure out other forms from that. Like, I don't know the research that goes into it or how it all works, but it's just like a really kind of kooky idea. Yeah. hundred percent. It's just like, all right, we don't have other forms to do these sort of things. Let's try and just sort of, you know, make them, I guess, or see if we can do it in these forms. Like, all right, this is a fascinating idea. Like, everything about this culture is just, like, really interesting. Yeah, but fascinating Captain and Logical 2. <laughs> <laughs> that we need some help. Uh, but apparently the soldier form is called War Form, where they grow this armor out of their... Out of their arm, shoulders, chest, and head. Uh, we, and we'd, we'd heard before, it's like, oh, like it looks as though the armor grows out of them. So it's nice to get confirmation yep. of that. Because that really explains why Shen got so upset about, and the Pasha Andy got so pissed about him wearing the bones. Like, he, like they're wearing the armor. It's like, oh, you actually are just wearing pieces of their body. Like, yep. you're wearing dead bodies. You're not just pulling off armor. Mm-hmm. We sort of guessed that already, but it's nice nice to have confirmation. And sure, nice says, you're getting better to the rhythm, speaking to the rhythm of praise. So the way they talk is even to the to whatever rhythm they're tuned into, which I guess would make like their speech patterns seem musical if they're always to like a, some rhythm. And he hums to skepticism. It's like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> just uh, really goes, nah, well, hey, nah, 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 nah. I, I just realized one of these books is called Rhythm of War, right? Yep. Oh, we got it. But it's 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 actually kind of interesting to me that it's like not only do they do they tune into these things and they're they speak in these rhythms. He just he doesn't even speak here. He just like hums at her and that express because of the tune that he is tuned into that expresses to her his skepticism. Like she just hears a little a little chunk of hummed music and understands what he's Mm. uh, expressing. And so Eshenai is a general, we find out. She's wearing war form for battle, but she likes work form better, more limber and rugged. They're trying, 
they're they're trying to do something in the Hall of Art and it's not working. She says, no spren. And he says, the guy says, not a one to the rhythm of mourning. Keep trying. We shall not lose this battle for lack of effort. And he's like, well, what's the point? Having artists won't save us from the swords of the humans. So artists won't help. But my sister is confident that she's close to discovering new forms. If we can discover how to create artists, it might teach us more about the process of changing. And that might help her. So there you go. Seems like a fun little parallel, really. Like. They're trying to discover something that was lost. Dalinar's mm-hmm. trying to discover something that was lost with the Radiance. Yeah, but he, here it almost seems sadder to me because like this, this is like an intrinsic part of them. Yeah, yeah. Although apparently, like she asks like no Spren, so maybe the Spren are involved here also. In which case, maybe it's very similar to what's going on with the Radiance. Could be. Mate form was better for creating art, but that came with a whole host of other problems. Keeping those types focused on anything productive was almost impossible. They just get so horned up. Other than that, they know dull form and nimble form. Uh, nimble form is a general purpose form used for nurturing young and doing the kind of work that just requires dexterity. Mm-hmm. Uh, the old songs spoke of hundreds of forms. Now they know only five. Well, six if you count slave form, the form with no spren, no soul, no song. That's the form the humans are accustomed to that they call parchment. So she says that's like an absence of any form. And so that's that's what the parchment are. That's why they're different from the Parshendi, because they have no form, which implies if they could somehow figure out how to take a form, then they would be the same as these other ones, maybe. Yeah, so that's when that's when Shen will get his uh, Rise of the Planet of the Apes movement. He, he just suddenly shapeshifts into some other kind of form and goes, no. Yeah, there you go. And yes, we find out she's their last shard bearer. Then she comes across a group of three mate forms splashing in the water, two female and one male. So here we have so annoying. Here we have two other gender terms. Mm -hmm. So she's Katie Holmes coming across Bruce Wayne in the pool with the ladies. (laughs) That's what you're saying. There you go. And she makes them get out of the water and they're all grump. They mutter to the rhythm of irritation. Meanwhile, the workers are singing to the rhythm of praise in their appreciation of Eshenai because they don't like confrontation. The rhythm of praise, I imagine, is like a gospel choir sort of song. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. She she scolds the mate forms. And she's like, I don't get people who like just staying in mate form. Like Most couples change and then sequester themselves away for a year and then come back. Like Who would want to be like that all the time? And then she's like, well, I mean, the humans do it. She hadn't understood early on that, like, the humans don't change forms. They're just always ready to mate, always distracted by sexual urges. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How can you live like that? Jeez. Ash and I, it's real velour. <laughs> Zap Brannigan yeah, what, is the, the height of that. What, what'd you say? Erotic. <laughs> erotic. 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 Uh, and so, uh, let's see. And she and the others had ordered the murder of the Alethi king in a desperate gambit to stop the listener gods from returning. And it was mentioned earlier in the chapter that they came to the Shattered Plains to escape their gods. And it had worked. The Alethi king had not been able to put his plan into action, but now they were being slowly destroyed. So, geez, what was he going to do? So I'm so confused. Like, they killed Gavilar to stop the listener. So to stop their own gods from returning. Yep. So... I'm so confused. Which shard are they about? Like, it, uh, was Odium their god, and they're trying to stop Odium coming back? Is that the implication? Could the be. Listener god. Hmm. I mean, it doesn't say god singular. It says gods plural and lowercase g. But that's true. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, this this is a, an interesting <clears throat> puzzle. You know, I'm forming a theory, and I'll, I'll save it for predicaments. But I'm forming a theory. Okay. Right, yeah. we, we will get to it in predicaments then. Uh, we also find out that the big craters that the war, the humans have t- made their war camps in used to be where her people lived before they abandoned them for the security of the plains. Uh, her sister is Venli, and Venli and her associates are the scholars of the, of, of the Parshendi. Nimble form, they don't actually have scholar a, a form for scholarship, but nimble form is the best they can do for now. Call it brain form. <laughs> brain make people dumb. No, Leela. Brain make people smart. <laughs> <laughs> Big brain and winning again. 
Now I am leaving Earth for no reason. <laughs> uh, Venli and in nimble form, you have long hair strands with no helmet to block them, like with the uh, war form, that go down to her waist. So very long hair in this form. You know, I, I, I know they had beards, but for some reason I never pictured them having hair as well. Right. And now it's like, okay, I think I'm, I need to see some more fan art of like Pa Shendi with hair, because like I'm, I'm struggling to picture the crap people with hair. Yeah, it's and it's I mean it seems like some forms have hair and some don't, so yeah, it's interesting. Mm. Yeah, it makes me think of um, Kit Fisto. Maybe it's like tentacly hair, but probably not. Ooh. One second. Oh, and Escher and I looks like Davy Jones. Yeah. <laughs> or in Mortal Kombat, like Cyrax, like the weird like cord hair. Oh, yeah, yeah, like the Predator style. Yeah, Predator style hair. There you go. Venli and her once mate Demid. They had been mate forms together. They hadn't had any children. In war, if they were on the battlefield, they would have been a war pair, which we learned earlier about, like, the Parshendi fight in pairs. So this is how it works. Like, I guess you are a pair with a person and of the opposite. I mean, there seem to be multiple genders, but so you... Unless you're that dude in mate form, and then you got another one. That's true. (laughs) But uh, so you fight together, you do whatever together. Now they're a research pair or something. And Eshenai says, we won the battle. The gem heart is ours. We will continue to eat. Dalinar Colin did not come. And Venley's like, yeah, he's not going to face you again. You nearly killed him last time. And she's like, what would you even do if you could talk to him? I'd sue for peace. We murdered his brother. We slaughtered King Gavilar on the night when he invited us into his home. That's not something they're going to forget or forgive. Which, I mean, she's not completely wrong. I mean, also, it's the Alethi. It's not like they need an excuse. Also true. So, that night, it had been a desperate plan made between herself and five others. She was part of it because of her knowledge of the humans. All of them had voted the same. Kill the man, kill him and risk destruction. Now all the others who had made that decision with her were dead. So really, she's she's the last remaining person other than Seth, who's behind the killing of Gavilar. And then Venli says, I have discovered the secret of storm form. And I was like, what? What the f- You're supposed to be working on like a diplomat or scholar form or something. And she's like, no, no, no. We can't make a deal with humans. We need the ancient powers. And I was like, Venli are gods. And Venli says, the humans have surge binders. Maybe not. It could have been an honor blade. So there's a discussion that I don't think we understand. Yeah, I've got no idea. I'm like, hang on, what? First we had shard blades, now we have honor blades, and honor was a shard. I'm so, what? Yeah. Is that, <laughs> what? <laughs> am I following that train of thought correctly? I mean, those are things, yeah. And I, I think yeah. we've heard the term honor blades before. The, like, we were told yeah. in, a, in the first book, I think that it was like some legendary something or other. Hold on, I'm going to bring it up now. Right there. Honor blade. Uh, okay, there's a section where Yasna says, "What about intelligence without ignorance? Finding truth with that, while not dismissing the possibility of being wrong." And Shalon says, "A mythological treasure, brightness, much like seeking the dawn shards or the honor blades." Hmm. Still so, tells us nothing. Yeah, no, it's some sort of mythological something or other, and presumably it's a blade. It's called an honor blade, so. Yeah, like you call something an on an on a blade. I don't think he's gonna walk out with a fucking minigun. <laughs> hey, it could happen. That would I mean, wouldn't that be That'd an be impressive exciting. weapon to have? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would that would that would really liven things up. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? What are these projectiles? He's shooting at us. <laughs> the the Alethia going on a canyon run, and it's like, oh, there's only like a dozen Pashendi. Like this is gonna be no trouble at all. What are those things they're holding? And they just open fire. Yeah, that's what storm form actually is. It's a storm of bullets. <laughs> Bullet storm. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, in a hail of bullets. Venley tells her that with enough people in storm form, we could control a high storm or even summon one. And Eshenai says, I remember the song that speaks of this form. It was a thing of the gods. And she's like, most of the forms are related to the gods in some way. Can we really trust the accuracy of words sung so long ago? It's true. Somehow. Uh, I mean, no, the ability to summon a high storm, that does sound like a pretty bonkers ability to have, considering right? what we've seen them do. Centuries ago, we escaped both our gods and the humans. Our ancestors left behind civilization, power, and might in order to secure freedom. With Stormform, we can destroy the Alethi army. I mean, and probably. 
Well, I mean, it can't hurt. That's for damn sure. If you can summon a high storm or control one. And so Venley says, look, I want to bring this to the five and I want you to be on our side. And Venley says, okay, I'll, th- I'll think about it. And that's the end of that chapter. So, so much to like take in with us. Finally, we've been talking for a book and the first part of this one now about how we just don't know anything about the Parshendi, what motivates them, why they do the things that they do. Now we're starting to get some ideas finally. Like, not that I really had like, any doubt that the Parshendi were not the evil that the Alethi make them out to be because the Alethi are kind of jerks. Not even kind of, they are jerks. But it just seems like the Parshendi just like, they just want to live and be free and you guys are fucking them up constantly. And it seems like even the reason they killed Gavilar was because you guys, was because they were going to get fucked up. And it's like, man, give the Parshendi a break. They're starting to remind me of like the, the aliens from District 9. It's like, they just, we just want to be free, man. I mean, you, yeah, I don't disagree with you because it does really sound like it's like we just want to live and do our own thing. But on the other hand, like no, but nobody else that we know of, at least, has any idea why they killed Gavilar. True. They, they just, could explain themselves better. Yeah, they, they they were invited to sign a treaty and then assassinated the king on the night that the treaty was signed, which is really messed up. And then they were just like, yes, we did it. And we were told that those three guys, the, the leaders of the Parshendi, said that. They came up, they're like, it was us, we did it, and then said nothing else, Yeah. even when they, they were hanged. Yeah. It's like, they, they probably could have played that better. But maybe it's a case of, like, if we tell them <laughs> why we killed, we, we killed Gavilar, someone else might try and do what he was planning on doing, whatever that True. was. So, yeah. They obviously got their own reasons for things. Yeah. Just a shit situation all around. Yeah, it's a real shit sandwich. Yeah. Shit fries on the side. (laughs) So I I don't disagree with you, but like the Alethi have no way to know that they had perfectly legitimate reasons. So I can understand what they're doing also. Even if you're right, the Alethi are generally kind of assholes. Yeah, it's just like we've we've spent like a long time just being exposed to the fact that Alethi culture is kind of shit, especially for like dark eyed people in general. So it's kind of like a I just want to (laughs) change. Yeah, it's like, we don't like the racists. Can we move on to, like, yep. it be on somebody else's side? Maybe we should all be on the Parshendi side. Maybe that'll that'll solve things. Yeah, yep. depending on what they're trying to prevent, we might be. Yeah, that's a fair yeah. point. I mean, we could have, if if it had happened as I as I predicted way back when, and Kaladin had ditched the Alethi camp and gone off to live with the Parshendi ages ago, maybe we'd have sorted this shit out by now. Who knows? Yeah, it's oh, true. Go. So... In any case, we move on to our last chapter, Yim. And Yim is a is a uh, an Eriali, or a guy from Eri, where uh, I, I believe that's where Adolin's mom was from, we learned. And he is a cobbler. He's sitting there trimming up a wood block that's going to be the basis of a shoe. And it turns out he's thinking that he's he needs a lot more kids-sized shoes lately. And we find out that there's something here. Something moving, and it, it's a spren that's been coming around a lot lately, but it, it looks – the description of how it looks is really interesting to me. Like, he's never seen it before. It, it says, like a, piece of, like, a piece of crystal suspended in a sunbeam. So this doesn't sound like any of the spren we've seen so far. And so Yim's sitting there like, yeah, what I'm doing, I'm making a shoe. And the voice is like, shoe. It's like, yeah, for children children little people and he's like yeah that that kind of thing and then the spren all of a sudden gets it says more intense and it says he comes and then Yim, yeah right yim sees somebody outside he's like oh crap is that is it the one the watcher in the military coat but no it's just a kid and yim's like hey yeah uh, no need to be scared come on in and it is a a kid who lives on the street where he only has a pair of trousers, no short, no shirt, no shirt, though that was common here in Erie, where both days and nights are are usually warm. But his feet are pretty messed up. And the kid says, they say you don't charge nothing. And he says, well, they're wrong, but I think you'll find my cost bearable. All I want is to hear your story. And the kid's like, yeah, they said you was strange. And Yim goes, they were right. And he has the kid <laughs> sit down. And it says that he, the kid, like, since he's Eriali, he has golden hair and skin 
The skin uh, less so. You needed to, the light to be just right to see it. The, the, who were the magical people we knew with the, we heard mention with the golden hair before? Well, I, I brought it up previously when we talked about how the Iriali have golden hair because uh, it came up with in relation to Adolin's mom. But there was a story back in the Lost Metal where the crazy conspiracy reporter lady was like, it's those it's those people with the golden hair. They're fairies or something, right? There are some group living in uh, in the city, not Elendil, the other building, I think, that had right. golden hair. OK, but we never actually met any of them. So it's hard to know if uh, what the deal is there. Those damn broadsheets. <laughs> <laughs> and so the kid, one of his feet is hurt. And he's like, why do you want to hear my story? You're older than anyone. I know. Grandpa old. You must know everything already. <laughs> Grandpa old. <laughs> <laughs> so the kid has a nasty cut on the bottom of his foot, already infected, crawling with rot spread. And the kid's like, yeah, I need need to get some shoes. Can't keep on without them. And Yim whispers, presumably to the spren, because he was calling it my friend earlier. He goes, my friend, I believe I'm going to need your help. And he takes out some some medicine which he knows is not going to be enough to heal this on its own, but it's a good distraction basically from what he's really doing where he pulls in some stormlight from some spheres that he's got. And while he's applying medication to the boy's foot, the glow is in his hand as he's rubbing the kid's foot and then it disappears and the, the rot spren flee from the wound and the cut has suddenly scabbed over and is returning to normal. So he has some sort of stormlight based healing power, which is pretty cool. And the kid's like, wow, that's some good medicine. Like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Only the best for this random shoe cobbler. Mm-hmm. And, this, and this street urchin that he's putting it on. And so the kid's like, why? Why do you want my story? Like, you're giving me shoes for free, really? And Yim explains that it's like, OK, long ago, there was only one. One knew everything but had experienced nothing, so one became many, us, people, so that it could experience things. And he's like, so you, the kid's like, you mean God? I mean, you could think about it that way, but not exactly. I accept no God, you should accept no God. We are Iriali, and part of the long trail of which this is the fourth land. Uh, everything, eventually all will be gathered back in when the seventh land is attained. It's like, all right. Deeply confusing. <laughs> yeah. And so Yim tries to explain that it's like we're all part of the same thing. It's all about perspective from up close. The fingers on a hand seem different. But when you look at it farther away, you see how they're all part of the same thing. And then he thinks, oh, that's probably a little complicated for this kid. But the kid is like, why do you get to be the finger with the expensive ring? And I got to be the pinky with a broken finger. Now? So he gets the, he gets the metaphor right away. <laughs> and so, yeah, the the guy starts putting together some shoes for him and they have this discussion and. He tries to make the kid understand, like, this this perspective that the Iriali people are are supposed to have. And eventually the kid's like, I mean, if we're all part of the same, then you don't need to give stuff away, like shoes, because it doesn't matter, right? So you wouldn't hit yourself in the face, would you? If I make your life better, I make my own life better. And the kid goes, that's crazy talk. I think you're just a nice person. And then he leaves. And Yim, the spren comes out again, and Yim's like, hey, thanks. Thanks for your help. And the spren goes, he's still here. And there is a guy in his back room, the place where he sleeps. It's like, wait, why is that door open? Uh Uh-oh. It is a guy with dark makabaki skin, except for a pale crescent on his cheek. He's wearing a uniform, thick gloves. And the guy says, I had to look very hard to discover your indiscretion. And he explains that uh, Yim, as a young man, drank and partied away his inheritance. But that's not that's not the crime. Murder is the, is a crime. And Yim says, I didn't know. They told me that, like, the, I delivered the bottle of wine and the vintage was supposed to be the message. But it turns out the wine was poisoned. So I guess he was he's an accomplice to murder. And Yim says, I didn't know. And the guy's like, you're guilty nonetheless. And he summons a shard blade and Yim tries to run for it. But uh, he's an old man now. He can't get very far without tiring himself up. And I like as he realizes he's about to die, he's like, I guess it's my time. May one find this memory pleasing. And he tries to he's like, it was 40 years ago, my dude. And the guy says, justice does not expire as he shoves the shard blade through his chest. Experience ended. So, yeah, that's uh, justice. pretty fucking dark. 
And it does sound, it's like a very vigilante sounding situation. There's a guy out here getting street justice with a shard blade. Yeah, it's the Punisher, but uh, the Makabaki Punisher. I don't know. The Punisher would care about this uh, this guy and the crime he committed 40 years ago, maybe. Uh, if it was murder, yeah, he would. Yeah, okay. Yeah, only only Frank Castle's murders for murder. That's, you know. Well, he was, he was an, like an unknowing accomplice to the murder. Like, come on. Uh, anyway, so yeah, those were our chapters, and we found out some a few interesting little bits. So, as we move into predicaments... I will give you guys, we're going to read three more chapters for next time. That's the last two of these interludes, and then the first chapter of part two. So I will give you guys the names, and you can try to make some predicaments. The next chapter is called Risen, Risen, whatever you want to pronounce her name. And she was the one, she was the one, she was the one who had the grass, yeah? Yep. Oh, nice. And then interlude four is called Last Legion. And then chapter 13 is called The Day's Masterpiece. So there you go. What, what, where are we going? What's going to happen? I've got no freaking idea on, on those chapters. Uh, the Day's Masterpiece. God, I, I don't know. Well, yeah, so last we saw Risen, she was tending her grass and traveling with her master. So I guess maybe they'll have come out of Shin by now. And maybe we'll see what, what happens to the grass when it's exposed to the the other side of those mountains. Yeah, I don't know. I, I've got no idea what any of this means. I guess um, the other interlude will probably be Escher and I since Yim is not coming back. At least we don't think so. I don't know. Yeah, like the the, the prediction I had was not based off any of that, was uh, in regards to Escher and I. And I think this is going to be a long-term one. I have nothing to go base this on but gut feeling. But I feel like the ruins that Esh and I and the Pashendi are living in are um, the ruins of Irithiru. Hmm, okay, okay. Yeah, I just something about like the importance of location, like they've retreated. They, they don't even seem to know why they've retreated here, but I feel like this is a place where some significant stuff is going down, so maybe they'll discover, like, that no one knows what these ruins are for, so I think, oh, you know... We talk about lost cities a bit in these books, so, and the road to Irithiru uh, has come up quite a bit. So maybe that's here. Maybe we've been here all along. Yeah, that's what I got there. Interesting, interesting yeah. possibility. Yasna seemed convinced that the Irithiru was not on the Shattered Plains, but that doesn't mean she was right. Well, yeah, no, Yasna has been wrong at times, but I just yeah, maybe and maybe that's like that's Shalan's thing. It's like you know she's learning that Yasna can't like is wrong about things mm. and you know she, and when yasna comes back because we, we all know that she will you know shalan can happily present this to her and like yeah like, that'll just be a nice little moment i don't Suck really have it, mu- you were wrong i was right <laughs> i don't really have much else to really talk about that was just something that occurred to me when reading about these ruins i'm like there's got to be some significance to these ruins they can't just be like an old abandoned city uh, yeah i still have the feeling that the shattered plains was you know where odium landed and that's why the planes are shattered like so so long ago so maybe he was the one who wiped your theory out maybe we'll learn more maybe we won't who knows it's a book we don't know you don't know <laughs> what am i talking about moving on moving on to what no okay fair enough <laughs> no, it's a decent prediction there's a we find out there's a city out here that no one knew about so and they're Yasna and Shalon are looking for a city, so yeah, you know. Well, it just, could it just seems like the Alethi don't really seem to know much about the Shattered Plains. No, they don't, for so, sure. Yeah, maybe we just learn more over the course of it. We'll see. Yeah. Oh, well, trying to think through everything here. So, the first chapter, I, I don't know, maybe we'll pick back up with um with her, probably not right where we left off, because... It's been some time has passed if that original interlude was taking place at the same time as the other events. But the the merchant maybe they may still be going about their way, but maybe there's some kind of like surge binding business going on with her, and she's finding power as well. You know, that'd be interesting. It'd be interesting if like every interlude guy, including like the Clear Lake guy, was all like, "Hey, I've got this little friend buddy now, and I've got powers." That'd be uh, that'd be fun. Clear Lake guy having powers all of a sudden. Hmm. And so I'm going to go with, I'm going to go with, we're picking back up with her, search binding stuff's going on. 
And then the interlude after that, we haven't had repeat characters in an interlude section before, so I don't know that it would be Esh and I again. It, I'd like it if it was, but I, I don't see that happening. I'm going to guess that maybe we'll go back to Clear Lake guy and something's going on with him. That'd be fun. Or Pure Lake. Pure, Clear Lake? Pure Lake? What are they calling? The Pure Lake, yeah. Pure, Pure Lake, Lake, my yeah. bad. Um, I like to see that guy again, too. He was funny. Yeah, he was funny. And, you know, somebody unassuming like him to uh, to have powers would be, be kind of fun. So, yeah, we'll go back to her and then Pure Lake guy. And then after that, I think we're going to have to head back to Shalon for a minute for the first chapter, maybe. Well, actually, we don't know. Now that I say that, we don't know the the section header for the next section. So it could list people and Shalon may not be one of them. Uh, oh, yeah. Should should I read that off since I gave you uh, a chapter in that? You're the, you're the guy. It's up to you, man. Yep. I guess you guys are going to read it when we get to this next one. So sure. OK, here. Yep. The the list of characters for part two is Shalon, Kaladin, okay. Okay. Adolin, uh-huh. and one more. Can anyone guess? Navani. The way you that phrase would... that makes me think it's not Dalinar, but yeah, Dalinar yeah. seems like the obvious guess, right? Yeah. Yeah, no, but uh, you wouldn't be you wouldn't be asking us if it was. So I'm gonna go with Wit. The the fourth one is Sadius. Oh, interesting. <laughs> He's the worst. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there, see, he can have his name. On you the can. fucking list of char- perspective characters. Why wasn't it the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Sadius. You're the worst. And we all don't <laughs> like you. Yeah, so I think we are going to pick it back up with Shalon then. Because she's the first one on the list. Checks out. Okay. We're going to check back in with her. Hanging out with Slaver Guy. Maybe she'll make it to the Shattered Plains. That would be surprising if she made it that fast. It'd be but... fast, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we don't know. Or maybe a third thing will happen. Who knows? And then here's my kind of overhauling theory that's not fully manifested yet, kind of not shaped. But while we were talking, it kind of just popped in my brain. So, like, what if the I don't know what shard, right? But whatever shard, what if they splintered, whether it was on purpose or not? And the Parshendi you're talking about gods or storm god or whatever, and different entities were we're basically handed this power, right? And so that's why there's like so much different magical forces slash power going on on this planet because they've got like all of these different entities bearing little tiny pieces of a shard and using its magics. And like maybe this, the head of the Spren is like one of the wielders of said splinter piece, whatever. Like I said, this is not fully formed, but like my idea of being like a, pe- a shard splintered and then there's different manifestations of this magic slash power. Although a lot of the magic that we're seeing is is derived from the Spren. So maybe that's not a great theory, but I don't know. There's some, I feel like there's, there's something extra going on here that hasn't been going on on other like two shard planets or one shard planets. Of course, the only other like two shard planet I could think of now is in one guy and then the other two, and then the other ones are dead. So like, I don't know. I mean, yeah. There's a lot of dead ones that were on double shard planets. Yep. A lot of dead ones. <laughs> and at least one dead one here. So, mm-hmm. yep. But yeah, okay. That's, uh, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, that's a weird one. I don't really know how to, how to make that <laughs> make more sense. I was Fair just enough. thinking, just my brain. This is how my brain works. Sorry, guys. <laughs> just my brain. Just uh, my brain firing synapses into the darkness. I mean, saying that Shalon's the first on the list, so the first chapter might be here, that makes sense. And also, I feel like the day's masterpiece, that sounds like a Shalon thing. That's like a Yeah. I mean a she makes thing, maybe. Yeah, she makes ma- she makes drawings. Oh yeah. yeah, what was the second interlude title? Uh Last Legion. Last Legion. See, so, yeah, I'm gonna stick with my Pure Lake thing because I feel like in that flashback or division that he that Dalinar had, he was in the Pure Lake and there was like some fighting going on there. So I'm gonna stick That's with true. that. That did happen, yeah. There was even, like, a big tower out there where he was like, this must not exist today because this would be famous. Maybe it's hiding out there somewhere. Maybe maybe Ishik knows all about it. Yeah, Ishik's like, oh, yay. I I just assume he sounds Canadian. I go catch fish there sometimes. Yeah, I just assume he sounds Canadian. (laughs) Hey there, brother. Yeah, I I could take you out to the the Pure Lake Tower. I love that place. Great fishing. All praise to the god we hate, so that he doesn't curse us. (laughs) I'd forgotten that. Yes, their their whole thing where they have to pretend to worship one god and secretly worship the other one. 
Yeah, you know, he gets jealous. Oh, man, good times. Okay, some some interesting predicaments today. We, we, we missed Jamie. Jamie didn't get to discuss the uh, the ins and outs of the Parshendi this time. Maybe she'll have mm. something to say when she comes back. Yeah. All right, let's see. Moving on to... We uh, we don't have that much ex- extra day. We have one email that I it was actually saved from last week, so I will read that one. This one does have a review attached, Joe, so get to get your misting list ready to go. Uh, I'm kind of glad that they added the review ability to Spotify because like the majority of our listening audience is on Spotify. It seems like, so it's nice that more of them now can get that uh, interaction. We, we had one message on discord uh, that actually came in before the last episode, but I kind of forgot. It just said, Hey, Sander Lynch crew, congrats on 200 episodes from Matthias. So thanks to one. Now we're still going. If you can believe it. We, we didn't get to 200 and go, ah, it's time to pack it in. Yeah, that's true. You know, and uh, we don't I feel like we don't say it enough. Uh, at least I don't. But, uh, you know, we appreciate you guys listening. Uh, you know, we would not have gotten to 200 episodes if we didn't have like I don't I don't feel like unless we had a, a group of people that were tuning in each week and hanging out with us, although not directly. So uh, we appreciate everyone that listens. And even if you don't like us that much, we still appreciate it if you listen. <laughs> You're allowed not to like us. It's like it's good. Yeah. We understand. Not everybody is. You not everything is for everybody, as I like to say. Uh, okay. The email that we have is from Libo. Libo. L Y B O. It says, "Hello there. I've put off writing another email to you guys for quite some time now because I haven't really been able to figure out Spotify's podcast reviews. Evidence of my hopefully successful attempt at giving a five star review can be found in the attachments. But I think now that you started reading Words of Radiance, it's time to do so regardless." Although I can't quite decide between Words of Radiance and Oathbringer, I think it's my favorite book in the Stormlight Archive so far, mostly because I really enjoy the Shallan flashbacks and some of her plot points. On the other hand, Oathbringer has some of my favorite emotional moments. Also, there's some good stuff with Hoyd. Speaking of Hoyd, I'm wondering whether or not I got the right impression that the crew also really enjoys him showing up once in a while. Do we like seeing Hoyd? Oh, fuck yeah. I mean, he's like he's like the lifeline to the Cosmere at this point, right? Because, uh, you know, maybe going forward, there's going to be a lot of crossover. That's that's what Brandon has seemed to indicate. But like before that, this is like the guy, you yeah. know, he's sexy drifter. I don't think you name him sexy drifter if you don't like him. Right, Joe? Yeah. <laughs> I asked myself out loud. <laughs> and, and I answered, answered like a twig. Yeah, Dak answered the question that Joe asked himself. <laughs> yeah. Classic. Uh, um, one last thing before I come to an end. I don't know whether this has come up as point of discussion before or not, but do you guys generally prefer the U.S. or U.K. covers for the Cosmere books? Myself, I think the U.K. covers are better most of the time. Anyway, thanks for making my Mondays a little better each week. Wasn't to the time of next liveo. Uh, before we get to the review, uh, what do you guys think? U.K. covers, U.S. covers? I really don't see the covers because I you sent them to me on uh on yeah, Kindles, Kindle. and uh, I I know there is a cover, but I just press the button and go into the book so i really don't see it <laughs> um yeah i'm not a guy who like looks up alternative cover arts for a book i've got the covers on the books that we have here and that's the one yeah. i look at i don't look up the rest like i'm you know like i know the, we've... like i'm sure the art is good on them but i, I don't go yeah. out of my way to look it up i know we've discussed the way of king's cover and how it doesn't really have anything to do with the book and i have looked at that one because we've discussed it and i would say i'm underwhelmed by the american the U.S. cover of it, for sure. It doesn't really, like, excite me to look at it. We looked at the the Words of Radiance cover at the same time, because it was, with, like, the Kaladin doing the Iron Man landing thing was the U.S. cover. Oh, that's right. So I did see it. Yeah, I mean, that one's okay. At least it's a character that we know and can identify on the cover. We know that the U.K. cover is, because Dak and Jamie have that one, is divided into two pieces. So here, I'll put it into our chat. There's the two yeah. parts of the Words of Radiance, uh, the U.K. cover. Yep. Kind of big cool. fan of the second cover. Not as big of a fan as the first one. Yeah, it's kind of blah. Like, like yeah, all the aside from the secret projects, all the oh, and Atlantis because we got the tenth anniversary for that one. All the books have like very much have this white with one color color scheme going on. So all the yeah. Stormlight books are red on white. Arcane Unbounded is green on white. Warbreaker is purple, and the Mistborn ones are blue. So they've all got a similar color scheme going on, and they're sort of abstract looking art. I know we talked about the Bands of Mourning one way back when, because like it had a statue on it. We were trying to figure out 
what the statue was and who the dude that's standing at the bottom of it was. Right. But yeah, it's mostly just like like this the one color white and one figure or something. Yeah. Most of the time, you want... Which is pretty cool and it's con- consistently thematic, but yeah, right. It's, it's like yeah, it's cool. I don't really spare it too much thought. Right. If you want to talk cool covers or at least disparities between covers, I would argue that and not just because I grew up with them, I would argue that the Harry Potter U.S. covers are way more interesting than the U.K. covers. Huh. The original U.K. covers are kind of, I mean, just kind of boring, in my opinion. Whereas, like, I feel like they went all out. The illustrator for the covers of the U.S. ones kind of went all out on these things. They're, they're pretty cool to look at. I'm looking through all of the alternate covers for Words of Radiance. The French version is also divided into two. I got to show you guys the the first part of the French one, because I, I, I think this is supposed to be a show nine, but it's kind of interesting. Hmm. Uh, but also oh. the graphic audio is divided into five parts. So each part has its own. I'm going to show you guys the first three, because I think they're, they're all actually pretty cool. This is the first one. And you guys can find, uh, not you guys, but people listening. If you want to look at the different covers, you can go to the copper mind wiki and it has a section under words of radiance for all the various covers. Oh, cool. Uh, that's the first one, which is it looks well, like a funny. chasm fiend and a chull. That's, that's got to be a chasm fiend. Yep. The second one is like somebody in our in shard plate who's ripped the gem heart out of a chasm fiend, and the third one is just Adolin and Renarin. But I think it looks pretty cool. Interesting. Hmm. The fourth and fifth ones are potentially spoilery, so I'm not going to share those. But Bet. so uh, I I think I will say in response to the question that we got. I like a lot of the U.S. covers. I think there is something to be said for the way that the U.K. covers, like Dak mentioned, they have sort of a color scheme across all of them. Like pretty much all of the Cosmere books have like the white. And so they look more uniform. They look more like a group than the U.S. covers, which are just kind of like all over the place. I have I should also mention, like, I don't have it because we got the like the hard the fancy hardcover. But I've seen. Uh, a version of a copy of Tress of the Emerald Sea in bookshops that has the same sort of scheme as well. It's and it's green. It's a much lighter green than Arcanum Unbounded on white. So I assume that all the secret projects got that as well, but I don't know what colors they got. Ditto at Atlantis. Interesting. Uh, oh yes, I, I I had to pull up the cover, but yeah, I see what you I see what you mean. It's got that same white base, but instead of the red, it's got the green. Yeah. Yeah. Now I want to see the different covers for Tress. Well, most of them are actually really similar. The UK one's the most different, it looks like to me. Interesting. Mm. Anyway, thank you for the email, uh, Libo. And looks like uh, Libo may be German because we've uh, the the screenshot from from Spotify of their five star review is uh, appears to be in German. Oh, cool. cool. What did they say in their five star review? Uh, you, you, you you can't write words in the in the oh, Spotify when you just put in the five stars. That's kind of boring. I yeah. mean that's fine. We love the five stars. Appreciate it for sure. Not not downplaying yeah, that's, the that's that's the a thought. dig at Spotify. <laughs> yeah, that's a dig at Spotify for sure. Well, Libo, I appreciate you, man. You're gonna be one of my favorites, a smoker. And and Joe's not saying you have to smoke cigarettes. No, smoke. No, I'm not saying that. You can burn copper. Oh yes, yeah, burn smoke that it yet? copper. Well, yeah, Uncle wasn't with the burn. Uh, so, if anyone uh, wants to get a cool misting power. You can leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or leave us a five-star review on yeah. Spotify or some other platform and send us a uh, an image of it so that we can have the proof and Joe will give yeah. you a Mistborn Power. If you want to email us, just an email or to email in your review, the a- email address is thesanderlanch at gmail.com. Find us on X and I almost said Spotify. We already know that we're on Spotify. X mm-hmm. and uh, Facebook and Patreon – where this week I've started putting up my reactions to Long Chills and Case Doe. Now that I've finished reading that book and recorded all of my reactions, it's only three episodes worth because it's a very short book. But uh, if you want to check that out, Joe, you can join our Patreon and Joe will give you a ferrochemical power as well. Yeah, that's true. We're going to have to figure out like some kind of other thing to give out like once we know all the Night Radiant powers. Yeah, th- there's been some discussion of that. Like if we, yeah. we want to switch from misting to night's radiant or something but yeah uh, that's, a, that's a tough one i don't know we will when w- once we know more i think either at the end of book two or three we may take because uh, 
They've got that uh, the the quiz. Brandon has the quiz on his website. That's like the Harry Potter ah, sorting quiz, but it's nice. for Knights Radiant Orders. And so cool. you guys will get to take that, and we can discuss that sort of thing at that time. Sweet. That sounds fun. Yeah. So uh, just take the quiz then. I'm not awarding it. You take the quiz. <laughs> when we get there, if you haven't ever taken the quiz, take it with us. Take it at the same time we do, and then you'll know. There you go. Uh, okay, anything else that we need to touch on? I don't think so. So, like I said, for next time, we're going to do three more chapters. That's the last two of these, uh, the first set of interludes, and then chapter 13, start us into part two. So three chapters for next time. Music by Miracle of Sound. And was to the time of next? Colo? P.S. Fasher. Crab at You forgot your name. Don't let your spirit fade away Amnesia You've been through such pain But you're growing stronger every day Amnesia